There's a reason why for the last 13 years, startups overwhelmingly prefer to build on top of AWS. We have the largest number of services, making it easy for you to take on some of the biggest challenges with the smallest teams. We also have partnerships with the top VCs, accelerators, and incubators around the world, making it easier to secure your next round of funding. I'm a solution architect uh, with the AWS uh, Ed Start uh, program. Uh, what we do is we work with startups in the uh, education sector, and we help them build their um, uh, services on AWS. So we power tech is AWS's diversity and inclusion outreach program. The program is really twofold. One is to increase the number of underrepresented technologists within the industry, and the second is to provide a platform for them to be seen and heard. If you're wondering how the AWS Evangelism team might be able to help your startup, there are many ways. We're technically credible across our entire catalog of products, so we can help you figure out which services might be able to meaningfully impact your business. We also want to help tell your story. So if you're building something cool, we want to know about it and help spread that message to the world. So you might end up on stage at an event like AWS Summit. If you're a startup, you should also definitely check out the AWS Lofts. These are event spaces that are free to anyone with an AWS account. And you can treat them like co-working spaces, but the awesome thing about them is that we also have people like technical evangelists like myself, solutions architects that come and give hands-on technical workshops and sessions to help you learn how to more effectively utilize the AWS products and platforms that you're already building on top of. We are a dedicated team of people that love startups, that we just want to come and help you with whatever we can, whether it be technical or business focused. We are here to help guide you and make sure that you know you do have a say in what's going on. We do get your feedback. We do bring that feedback to the service teams. That is what we're here for. So hi everyone, sorry for the slight delay. I hope you enjoyed the video from AWS, our amazing partners for this one. Uh, let me just give you a brief intro of who we are, what we're doing, and then we'll hand it over to our amazing speaker who's joining us live from, uh, all the way from San Francisco, Silicon Valley. Uh, so my name is Ardish Azam. I run the Startup Grind community in Pakistan. Uh, this month we're running this mentorship month in collaboration with AWS Amazon Web Services and the purpose of this is to uh, arrange mentorship sessions like this uh, to help our community but also to bring the community together in these times, uh, especially arranging these virtual events on a consistent basis so that everyone has a place to get together, to meet new people, to make new friends. Uh, we're really thankful to our amazing uh, partners all across Pakistan and beyond who made these series uh, possible. Uh, Startup Brand, if you don't know, is the world's largest community of startups, founders, innovators, creators. Uh, we have been operating globally for the past 10 years in more than 600 cities, 125 countries. Uh, and, and we do monthly fireside chat events just like this, uh, where we bring the community together uh, to connect them and help them learn.
So startup in Islamabad, I have been running for the past three years. Uh, and here uh, we have been bringing together uh, monthly events. I've personally hosted more than 110 digital leaders in events that have brought together many, many entrepreneurs in the community. We've also hosted the Startup in Pakistan conference, which bring together uh, more than 1500 leaders. We have hosted some of the top entrepreneurs, educationists, founders, investors from Pakistan, but also from outside Pakistan. We take a lot, we did a lot of these virtual events, but also when they came come to Pakistan, we engage them, we connect them with the community. These are some of our past speakers that we have hosted in the past three years in Islam. And we also have now chapters across Pakistan in more than 15 cities. We have hosted some of the most amazing digital leaders from inside and outside Pakistan. Uh, some of our highlights include organizing the first Startup Grand Conference in all of Asia, which we did in last November in Islamabad, uh, which brought together more than 1,500 people from all walks of life to help them uh, connect for uh, the future of digital Pakistan. With this event, we'd like to invite you for two amazing offers from AWS. So number one is that you can we will send you a form after this event. You can fill the form to get a one-on-one -on -one mentorship session in five different domains from a long list of AWS mentors. So they are helping us with this. And also if your startup or company uh, is looking for AWS credits, we'd love to help you out. We'll send you the link on how to apply and you can get up to $100,000 in free AWS credits. With this, I'd like to introduce our amazing speaker for today. He's not only just a, a, a known UX guru, but also a really good friend of mine. Mudassir Rizimi is a UX UI instructor at UC Berkeley, but he is also he also works at Wells Fargo, which is one of the biggest banks in the US. He does interaction design for their commercial electronic office, the so CEO portal. The portal is doing three trillion dollars of transaction every year, so that's just amazing. Uh, one other thing that not uh, I hope a lot of people know about Madrasa in Pakistan is that he was the primary evangelist who brought Urdu language, so Urdu Nastalik font to iOS devices. So more than 2 billion Apple devices in the world now have Urdu font because of him. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. I'll just hand it over with this to you and take it. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Arzish, and uh, for an amazing introduction. And thank you, Startup Grand Islamabad, and thank you to all the participants and uh, the partners, actually. So let me share my screen and let me know if you guys can see my screen, uh, and we will go from there. So you will see my amazing desktop. If you're seeing it, let me know. Uh, all is working from your end. Yeah, now we can see an amazing picture of a mountain. All right. So uh, you are seeing my uh, screen, which shows you the title slide. So let's begin. Thank you, Arzish, again. So hi, uh, I'm going to go and talk a little bit more about myself first, and then we will jump into the, uh, the core of our uh, presentation. I'm an enterprise UX designer, researcher, design strategist, aspiring product manager, and mentor and speaker based in San Francisco. I'm working on a mission critical application, as Arzish was saying. There's, uh, you know, at Wells Fargo, uh, it's a portal, commercial electronic office portal. It's a commercial side of the banking industry. That portal is doing $13 trillion of transaction every year. And uh, again, uh, I'm the guy who brought the Urdu language on uh, 2 billion iOS devices. My driving force, curiosity and empathy, because I believe the combination of these characteristics makes you a good human, an exceptional leader. Because the first step in design thinking methodology is empathy. I believe it should be part and parcel of all of our activities and actions. And once we combine it with curiosity, we will end up discovering the idea of an ideal human and a leader. Why I'm saying it? Because product don't sell that very often. The team behind the product are the core essence. If they are empathetic, they have curiosity, 
they can solve any kind of tough problem that their you know target personas are facing i usually pen down my thoughts <clears throat> and exploration either on the linkedin and or on uh, or on medium so what to expect right so it's a seven part series as arzish was saying and i have a story to tell you when i was start getting a little bored from software development back in 2008 i got inspired by the field of ux and however i'm like a typical nerd who learns things by doing this leads me to observe and learn about this new found field from the story perspective and that's how i started my career in the ux the story lead me into the learning by doing right and because of that you know uh, i was able to came up with all the urdu apps and what have you welcome to the series of roi of ux series you know i will share with you the stories which will which will tie perfectly well and with the design thinking methodology and it, and if you apply all what i'm going to lay out in front of you i am dead sure you will see the significant impact on your product and their revenue and also the customer uh, retention so let's begin <clears throat> we all are aware of this story can anybody tell about it i don't know if i can see the uh, chat uh, window right now but uh arzish what are people saying about this uh yes sidra story actually. yes what, what she said yes oh yeah okay so it's so a tortoise and hare right so we also remember the lion and red red riding hood aladdin and what have you why we remember these stories even though we are in our late 20s or 30s right and we heard about these stories at the age of 5 why we still remember those stories what are the reasons can anybody you know uh, speak out or you know uh, if you are not mute or you can put it on the chat session so uh, arzish can talk about it <clears throat> okay you know let me solve your mystery so this is the thing, right? Stories are memorable, relatable, consumable. And basically, the main tenant of those stories are they're sticky. Why they're sticky? Because they resonate with me. You know, the good and evil, lazy and the active person, right? So they actually connect with me when I see them in action in my real life. So UX is related, is related to a per so what is UX? All right, let's talk about the UX first. UX is related to a person's emotion and their attitude toward a product or services. That's why we typically hear the complaint, something like this: "Oh, this product sucks because it's unbearable." Have you seen how annoying the services is? When I called them to cancel the order, it took me an hour. And it's the real life stories. I've been through that, you know, recently because of this virus pandemic, uh, I had to upgrade my uh, Comcast services. It took me 20 hours to set up my, my uh, you know, the modem and my router. 20 hours. I spent five hours on the phone with the Comcast service people, three hours with the Google, uh, you know, uh, customer support to set up my router properly. So design thinking is a methodology, a process in the vast ocean of UX, a very popular tool among many. There are so many out there. It has five stages. In this first part of our series, I will tell you the stories around those five stages. The real life, the real life story, not the fake ones. Those stories will highlight the impact of design thinking methodologies in terms of revenue, and market retention and the customer delightfulness. So there are many formats, as I was telling you guys about design thinking around the world. However, personally, I love the interaction design organization laid out, laid it out. You know, the way it laid it out, the format they had. It is crystal clear and to the point. So what is design thinking? It's a non-sequential process. It's about understanding your user and also killing your assumption. So we're not going to be relying on assumptions. We will, uh, we will be testing our hypothesis in this process. 
and also it will give us a chance to reframe the problem properly and also obviously at the end we will end up creating usable solutions so let's talk about the design thinking stages first there are five stages of design uh, thinking methodology and we will unpack each stages with a story i will show you how it impacted a service or a product in terms of marketing uh, market pen, uh, penetration revenue or in terms of software development so remember that design thinking is not just about how you can make a super awesome product but how you can create a good culture among your team it can be applied anywhere so these are the five stages empathize define ideate prototype and test <clears throat> So let's talk about empathy, right? So what is how, what do we mean? What do we mean when we say empathize? Understand and share the feelings of another person or another, right? So who is she? She is Deborah Adler, and she Deborah has a very amazing story. In two thousand four, she was a grad student at uh, SVA in uh, New York looking around for a thesis project when she saw her grandmother accidentally took her grandfather's medication it was a epic moment for her she it was not catastrophic obviously uh, thankfully uh, but she found a very awesome problem actually so the modern prescription bottles were and still are somewhat confusing I don't know if you have if you've been to US and you have seen uh, on the left side uh, you have seen that you know uh, that prescription drug bottle usually typically coming from you know Walgreens or CVS uh, they are typically they are, they are very bland you know boring actually and confusing as well a complete mess she designed a system that could be color coded with a proper typography for people who are sick and have trouble reading the tiny typeface and making it less confusing by creating a proper layout the bottle imagine that the bottle was almost immediately picked by the target it's a big corporation right and it become the permanent collection in museum of modern art and later declared a design of the decade by industrial designers society of america so her mantra as we have seen earlier on the slide if you want to change the world go to gimba and what is gimba gimba is a place you know the actual place right <clears throat> it's a japanese term gimba is a japanese term meaning the actual place so if you apply the empathy you are actually talking to your real user walking in their shoes and finding the right problem that you have to solve apply gimba she basically collected the data before she jumped into her design by observing and hearing the actual people who are getting affected because of the poor design she did not assume all right she did not assume empathy is the most powerful tool you can have at the moment if you remember one thing and one thing only through our throughout the series you know just remember one thing then just memorize this word and ingrain it in your heart and in your mind empathy now let's go to the second stage of our design thinking which is define framing user needs so back in 2012 when I was running a small company named Corto by LLC, uh, we received an email on our uh, very uh, common email address, which was info at Kurtoba.net. My the then partner, uh, Arjuman Azimi, forwarded me an email which reads, I want to meet with Modas Razimi, a UX designer. I have an app idea that I want to discuss. That was the one single liner email. I replied to this, uh, to his, you know, the person's email. And met with him at Starbucks, located on uh, located on a Montgomery and Market Street interaction uh, intersection uh, uh, in San Francisco downtown. 
when I asked him, tell me what you have done so far about your app. Any research that you have done so we can come around and help you out or, you know, identify other problems or, or whatever you're looking for. His reply was, oh, no. Only thing I know is this app will be a social e-commerce app for kids. That's it. That was the only thing he told us. Well, from that point onward, I spent along with my partner five days with him, you know, with this customer at his place. We start our day at 9 a.m. sharp. And imagine commuting from Fremont to, Fremont to San Francisco every day, 45 to 50 minutes uh, during uh, rush hour. And we usually end our day at 7 p.m. daily for next five days. What we were doing, we help defining the product actually. We were framing the user need and made sure that we do have a version one and version two for him. Guess what? Once the app got developed and deployed, it got coverage in TechCrunch. TechCrunch is a big deal, right? Imagine that your the app you worked on getting a coverage at TechCrunch, right? Now imagine this UX team of one. That was me by myself from a product design perspective. We were able to define the whole product and its future roadmap. It took us like another one month, right? To come up with uh, the wireframes and what have you and use a journey and things like that. But our solid base was our definition. And, and we end up getting uh, coverage in, in TechCrunch. Now that was the coolest thing ever happened because in the defined stage, you collect the information you created and gather during the empathy stage, right? You deduce your observation and then synthesize them to define the essence of the problem. You and your team have identified in your target persona. So imagine that, go back to Deborah Adler's you know, story. What she did, she observed, deduce, synthesize and define her problem. Same thing we did in our Wishwap application. You should always seek to define the problem statement in a human centered manner. As you know, remember that. Don't use jargons. Don't use fancy words. Use a simple language that even a kiddo who is in grade three or grade two can read it easily. Let's come to this stage. Idea. Third one, right? Generate multiple ideas based on qualitative and quantitative observation. Okay, on October 9, 2014, I wrote one of my infamous letters to Tim Cook regarding Nestle typeface on iOS. The story started somewhere in May, 2014, when one of my senior ex colleague tagged me to the post, which talks about the death of Urdu script. And I wrote the reply back in, uh, immediately uh, in, the same, uh, in the same month. From that moment, I start ideating, you know, ideating about the problem, how to get the nostalgic typeface on iOS. So I was experimenting with the, uh, I think at that time it was iOS 7 with custom fonts and what have you at that time, uh, whatever was available to me. So what is nostalgic? Nostalgic is a unique typeface for Urdu language. 100% of the books printed in Pakistan and in India are using the nostalgic typeface which is totally opposite of the type typeface we have seen all of us you have seen you know uh, including myself on computer and smartphone and tablet it's like they're using nusk right so these days only android os and i think windows you know not supporting this typeface at its official capacity but you can obviously customize your android os right when i wrote this letter I laid out in my further communication after receiving a call from Tim Cook's office that which font they can use. So I ideated a couple of different ideas, right? Like you can use this font or you can use that font and you can, you know, uh, and also I create my competitive analysis regarding multiple fonts. Guess what they picked? They picked Google Note on Nestle because that was one of the idea I, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I experimented and gave it to them during my, you know, uh, communication at that time. So it was how, and also I, I defined the whole how to recreate the same solution at their end. So they don't need to 
keep bothering me or you know keep you know relying on me so this helped me when i did ideation like multiple ideation of say of one single problem how to solve it regarding the solution of that problem it helped me in a very in a very precise way right because whole idea was bringing the nestle typeface on system level then guess what September 12, 2017, Nest Leak typeface became the official typeface or Urdu on two billion iOS devices. So when you so ideate is the third stage in design thinking methodology. This is where you, as a designer, as a th- whole team, are now ready to ideate different ideas. A solid background knowledge that you acquired through your target personas, right? When you define the problem. it should you know the problem definition i would say should be your lighthouse like what actually we are solving this is the point where you have to start thinking outside of the box don't hold your horses all right this is where i say usually sky is blue and grass is green kind of scenario think about everything observing the user should have given you an idea how people are thinking about the problem what kind of you know A struggle they are going through. Focus on what they are doing instead of what they are saying. Because sometimes they say, "Oh, we are fine, we are cool, we are dandy with this product." But when you're going to observe them, what you're going to notice, they are doing something different. And there are lots of I, I will, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, time to time during my series, I will share my uh, the resources that will help you to gain more insight. For example, how to ask the proper question. what kind of questions you have to ask why we should not be putting our uh, the you know the uh, word in their mouth i think that's how it goes right so how to unearth and identify what actually you know what they are doing how to see see them right <clears throat> so let's go to our uh, second last uh, stage which is a prototype and what is prototyping experiment and observe which solution going to make sense so you create lots of solution you you ideate it right 10 uh, like five solution now we're going to test them we're going to identify them we're going to see hey which going to work well which is actually solving the user's problem so i have another story with you so this is the guy tom chi ex googler he spent years building the ux team for google x division he was on a team which developed the google glass actually and i don't know how many of you have google glass but now you can snatch it for a little cheaper than when they introduced uh, earlier i think it was like 1200 dollar at that time so he was on a team which developed the google glass and when he spoke about his experience at his very famous ted talk he shared his team process of creation <clears throat> that method goes by the name of rapid prototyping even though google glass took months right as i was telling you earlier but it helped them envision how things going to be and also what are the what are the things going to be a big hurdle but it took them just can you imagine okay imagine that imagine that again took them one freaking day to create a prototype of this complex product here's how they did it let me unpack for you his team made prototypes using a regular material they were simple off the shelf component to represent the headpiece their team was uh, used the clay actually that weighted the same amount of electronic pieces which they were anticipating in the real product <clears throat> so he wrapped the clay in paper and attached it to the modeling wire and voila makeshift glasses this was a point where they recognized to determine how the weight needed to be distributed between the nose and ears on the distinct head head pieces right because you don't need like the the glass is tilted like that or like this way right now when it, when it uh, when the time comes to build the projection screen how they did it? they use the binder clay hair bands and white board and chopsticks like these are the items you can find in your kitchen this approach validated their idea that if they want this screen or not this is an experimental phase tweak around don't worry about you know if you don't have certain kind of tools or what have you or you are struggling with oh if i have this line of code or you know if i have that piece then i gonna try to you know 
try to be like Sherlock Holmes or MacGyver, if you if you remember, if you are old enough to remember, right? Just experiment with some ideas. The aim is to identify the best possible solution for each problem. This is where you can build a solid MVP and test with your intended customers. Now, let's move to the last stage. Again, even though I'm telling you all these sequentially, remember, this is a non-sequential methodology, all right? So if you find something wrong in your uh, prototype and you think that you know the problem that you identify is not the right problem, Hey, go back and you know define your problem back, you know, and see uh, what what's gonna work and what's not gonna work, or what was the actual problem actually. So back in 2008, let me tell you another story, very interesting one, and I talk about this during our this you know Pakistani Tech Summit conference back in Feb, actually before this uh, weird virus. <clears throat> so back in 2008, a giant e-commerce company approached a design team and asked them why their users are abandoning their car, shopping cart. They did the usability testing and found out that customers were having problem during checkout process. They were getting forced to register to complete their purchase. The ones who had accounts with them did not remember password. And even when they click on forget password link, they usually don't come back to complete their purchases. Now, before telling you how they fixed it, let me run some number to you. So what they found out that 45% had a multiple registration in the system. Imagine that there was 160,000 forget password requests. 75% of those who requested passwords never completed the purchases. How they solved it? Simply, they introduced a continue button with the message, you don't need to create an account to make a purchase and guess what? It brought them $300 million for every that year. Imagine just introducing this tiny button which says, oh, you know, uh, continue as a guest. You don't need to register. And while, you know, uh, dear, in, uh, in Feb when I was preparing the uh, presentation for uh, ours, you know, in Pakistani Tech Summit, I did evaluate a couple of Pakistani e-commerce website and guess what? They are, you know, having the same problem. Why we are repeating the same old mistakes? Why we are becoming the hurdle by ourselves in between $300 million? Like, we are we are not learning from our mistakes. That's, that's not cool. So I have another story on the same ring. So one company earned $300 million, right? One company lost $1.7 billion. It was a costly survey. Let me tell you, back in 2008, 2009, Walmart ran a survey and asked from their customers, would you like Walmart aisles less cluttered? So, Customers, yeah, whatever, yes, we need to be less cluttered, right? They did not, the Walmart did not listen to their customer properly, right? So what Walmart did, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars and uncluttered their stores, removing, imagine, 15% of their inventory, shortening shelves length, clearing aisle, right? Why? Trying to get the customer inside through a dumb survey? Surveys don't give you a proper insight. All right, guys, don't ask me to rate your service through a survey. Talk to me as a person and I will tell you. If you're going to run the survey, you know what? I'm in rush. Maybe I just gonna say 555 five, five to everything. And that scale is also not gonna work well. And I will talk, tell more about, I will talk more about it in our uh, series. So it was an expensive misadventure. Rather than observing what customers are actually doing, they relied on a useless survey. Do not rely on assumption. 
this is what Walmart acted without stepping into their customer shoes. And this misadventure cost them $1.67 billion in revenue. Imagine that. Imagine just relying your insight on survey. So don't repeat these mistakes, right? And the customer experience is all about what customer do. So Walmart acted without uh, considering the customer experience. And that was a big mistake. Maybe the biggest mistake in the history of businesses. Testing phases when designer, when the whole team rigorously testing the complete product or MVP using the best solution identified in the prototype phase. This is the final phase of model, but in an iterative process, such as design thinking, the results generated are often used to redefine one or more further problem. All right. Now, this was the final test, right? This was the final uh, step, the testing. However, there are stories that, you know, I, I told you all the stories you know, highlighted the true ROI of UX through design thinking methodology. This is how the process works. It, you can go back, you, you learn something, you say, hey, you know what, my, my problem definition did not make sense. While you were at the last stage, go back, define your problem, redefine your problem. Maybe you have to go back again further, you know, on empathy and try to find out a little bit more depth from user perspective. So you, it's a non-sequential process. So I have a saying and I usually say, and there's a reason I'm telling you here. So as a UX designer, you should be tool agnostic. You should be process agnostic. All right. Be flexible in your tactic. Be firm in your strategy. Yeah. But be flexible in your tactic. So friends, today you learned the design thing process from the lenses of return on, return on investment through stories. In my next part of the series, I'll share with you some strategies and tactics which can help you convince your bosses and your customers if you're a freelancer, why adding a specialized UX person to be part of the team from day one. All right, remember from day one, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, I'm now available. Thank you, thank you so much for an amazing session. Let me just unmute, let me just allow the participants to unmute themselves. So if someone has a question, we can do one by one. But just a request, when you ask a question, just please introduce yourself, where you're from and what you're doing briefly as well. So any questions? I think we're getting some questions in the chat room. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me turn on my chat and uh, okay. Can you help me uh, to actually? Uh, yeah, there should be a button saying chat in the bottom. So whose question? I'm thinking so in this case, okay, uh, where should I start? So uh, Sin Leon. She has a question, right? So I think specifically in this case, you need a mechanism by which tells you what actually worked and why. So you don't go about redefining the same problem repeatedly. Sometimes we default into the easy trap. So this is your question. Sin? Can we unmute Sin? Yeah, she can unmute herself. Let me okay. Unmute her. All right. So let, let's go to Azim Abbas question then. You know, UX designer should be tool agnostic. Yeah. You know, what do I mean by that is if you, you hear a company who says, oh, no, we're just going to, or, or you, we're going to use this tool only or that tool only to solve the problem. So this is a limitation. Don't put yourself, you know, don't limit yourself actually. So learn how to cook. All right. Don't follow the recipe. If I have to simplify, what did I say more? 
because Bruce Tognazini, this is where I learned from uh, the Nelson Norman, uh, Nelson Norman group, you know, uh, the, uh, the founder, the partner, he said this thing during one of his, you know, classes that learn how to cook instead of follow the recipe because the recipe is just going to limit you. Right. So in, in the similar, similarly learn every different type of strategy, every different type of methodology. So, you know what to apply when, and actually you can mix and match. You don't need to like follow to the dot some process. You can go with a Google sprint and mix with a design thinking methodology, depend on your company's uh, culture or your team culture, product culture, right? <clears throat> oh, so okay. Sin was replying to someone else. So what, what are the best ways to empathize if you already think you have come up with some idea? Okay. You know, try to solve the problem which do exist, right? So how to empathize? Very simple. Uh, go talk to your customer. Instead of asking them, is this the right solution? No, don't ask them. See how they are going or doing a certain uh, thing that you're solving. Learn what they are doing instead of asking them and say, hey, look, you know, oh, I have this solution. What do you think about it? Yeah, sure, it's, it's good. But if they say they don't care because you know the way they are doing this process, which is very simple for them uh, with the existing tool and they don't care about the new solution. So there you go, your product got shot down immediately, even before it took a flight. Can you, okay, Mr. Saddam Shadab from Codematics, can you please tell me the initial steps before starting on any product are you solving for the right problem or you are just creating the solution and whose problem do not exist so find the real problem and then build the product around it if you don't don't waste your time time is the money actually it's all boils down you know uh, it all boils down to the time time of customer time of yours time of your uh, company time of your team Okay, Mike Gellers, have you ever used, okay, have you ever used a tool uh, like look back or, okay, hold on, it's like jumping, jumping. Sorry. I'll, I'll Mr. Record. Record. So have you ever used a tool that looks like a uh, look back or full story to record user behavior in the tool? And yes. Oh yeah, they are interesting. And I have a story because, you know, when I was building a first app in Ur on, uh, for Urdu language for kids, uh, I did, you know, I uh, recorded couple of you know sessions uh, using uh, these tools but not exact the, uh, this exactly the one that you're mentioning I uh, user zoom I guess at that time and it helped my developers actually why because my developer you know next day he was like I did not know that this is how the users are using our product it's very fascinating it, it, it gives us an actual insight that how you know uh, the customers the users were using actually the tool. So they are very interesting too. So any, any of your recommended tools? Oh, whatever works for you. As I said, I'm tool agnostic, even just simply like shooting from, from your camera, right? You know, from your iPhone. Makes sense. I, I'll, I'll tell you the next question. So sin is okay. asking, in legacy verticals. It is rather difficult to convince stakeholders of the value of design as a practice. Uh, have you ever developed any financial models to aptly attribute true ROI to uh, say an MVP, which does not have clear cut financials. You know, I don't have any specific tool, but here's what I do. I tell them the story regarding $300 million button. Right. And also I recently learned about the Walmart, uh, $1.67 billion mistakes. And also I tell the story about like, Hey, look, you know, this is what happened. This is what I did. And this is what in the world is happening out there. If you like it, that's fine. If you don't like it, that's fine either. You know, it's, it's their money, right? They want to waste it. They want to waste it. But you have to empathize. You have to tell them the whole story. Because I think the next, uh, the, there's a next series, ours is coming up with the storytelling, right? So learn how to tell your story. Convince them. Because if you don't, vertical market or not, everyone, if you, if you start, you know, step back, what are you going to find out? As a human, we have a similar pattern regarding a uh, problem and there's a similar way to solve the, sol uh, 
there's similar pattern to solve the problem as well, right? Because customers, stakeholders, they talk in, in the language of money. Uh, developers, they talk in the language of time, that how much time they're going to save. Yeah, so Usman is asking, how do you tackle with the bias that arises due to a difference in language uh, during UX research? Awesome. Being neutral and unbiased and you know, focusing on the user need is very difficult and very challenging. Again, data, bring the data on the table, bring the insight, bring the interview, observation, diary reading, right? Shadowing your customer. So this will help you and help those who are actually very biased toward their certain solution to see that problem. I think I, there's a story I'm forgetting, but there was, a, uh, there was somebody who actually a uh, higher executive, he was very much convinced. I think there's some airline industry. He was very much convinced that, oh my God, he found the right solution, but he was wrong actually. I think it was United Airlines or it was uh, the, the company who runs the British Airway. So I, I, will, I will post it in my, you know, uh, on the page. Yeah, so Manahil is asking, uh, how do you prove the worth of primary research and speaking to users? Often I'm told that just copy a successful app and no need to talk to users. Just to Oh, interesting. One. So I, let, me, let me tell you the story, all right? So I was at Wells Fargo, my initial days, and I had to test the table, comp uh, sorry, calendar component, yes. So uh, I asked for the budget or, you know, a process so I can actually, uh, you know, uh, run a test and find out if it's going to worth it or not. They did not approve my budget. Guess what I did, you know, uh, even though it's a big corporation, but because there's certain, you know, criteria I have to fulfill to get the budget, but it was a very tiny product. Like if the calendar experience is uh, worth, you know, uh, is worthy or not. Guess what I did? I did not, you know, I did not hold, hold myself back. I went ahead, applied the Gorilla user testing on my own, talked to the users, you know, talked to the people who are very close to the user, right? Sometimes it's difficult, it's challenging to find the user or because of the company policy, you cannot find them. What you have to do is find the people who are very close to the customers, like sales team, right? Or the call center people, talk to them see what they are saying, what, what kind of stories they are, you know, hearing from the user, tell them, you know, become their friend. So you will at least get a bit closer to your user. And when the company has a budget, then, you know, go from there. Yeah, so Mohsen is asking, what if client is not ready for the design thinking process and wants the actual product UI, how to convince it? Oh, do not introduce them the design thinking process. Use the different words. And there's a undercover UX book I would recommend. So what they're saying is be sneaky about your, you know, wording because sometime when they hear the design thinking process, they think, Oh my God, there will be, you know, extra uh, 900 hours or, you know, 100 hours of work going to be added on their, uh, uh, in their queue, which is nobody likes it. Right. So try to balance them out. Try to, uh, you know, uh, bring few, introduce few things, tiny things, micro things, right? So you cannot introduce, like, think, think of it like you are introducing a baby how to walk, right? So baby has to crawl first. So some companies, they don't have that kind of design culture in their, you know, in, uh, design culture. So that's fine. Understood. Introduce tiny things one by one, you know, step by step. So don't just show a uh, whole process on, on top of them. Maybe let's say, hey, you know what? Let's define the problem. I don't understand the problem. How, wh what, what we are trying to solve. So create a tiny workshop, be mindful about their time. Yeah, so Rohma is asking, I'm new to UI UX field. Uh, what do you recommend way to start from? Oh, <clears throat> the way I started, as I said earlier, I was convinced through the stories, right? Everybody is different. Everybody is like unique. So find your North star. And I would say the best way to find your North star is like, you know, read the element of UX from uh, JC James Garrett. He, he actually identify all the structure, the everything included in the UX, right? 
and see which which resonate with you you may be the info you may be like you know like to uh, categorize the information properly so you can be the ia or you like to you know spend time unearthing the proper proper problems or you know understanding your customer or user or people then user research might be your field right or if you are coming from the visual design side then that's a very interesting field as well or if you if you are a programmer then get into the ixd side it depend you know depend on your choice but start from the book uh, elements of user experience by jc james garrett yeah so amara is asking can you please briefly walk us through how you went about the research to frame user needs for the app that was featured in techcrunch uh, so how do you decide the scope and direction of user research no can you brief briefly walk us through how you went about the research to frame user needs uh, for the app that was featured in techcrunch oh so uh, how did we do the user research okay so we started our day one by talking to the intended customer which were neighborhood you know kiddos so we start bugging them we start you know uh, with their uh, why their parents were present we start interviewing them like what they are actually looking for why they want to create the wish list for their grandma why cannot they talk over the phone and what have you so this actually help us to identify things from their end and from the stakeholder perspective what is you know from the budget aspect what we can bring on the uh, commerce so it's a mix of of user observation and user interviews that helped us form the product design uh, product road map for that wish pop app so haris is asking how can we differentiate between ui and ux with an example differentiate between oh okay okay so ux is a umbrella term right that's very common people do mix ux with the ui not fair not true ux is an umbrella term right it's a big term and in the ux there's a ixd there's a user ui user research uh, uh, accessibility expert usability expert content team members ux writer they all come in one umbrella term right so ux is all about everything which is which is you know touching your user from any aspect either from the content from the visuals or from the interaction perspective right and also from the accessibility perspective however ui is not an ux and there's a uh, there's an amazing website which actually lays out let me see if i can find out this ux is very interesting and fun ux is not ui ah uh, yes that's the one please 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 you know uh, as we say in urdu iska ratta laga lo you know just you know memorize this thing and uh, put a poster in your company uh, in the corridor of your company or anywhere where you are working actually so amara is asking how do you decide the scope and direction of user research if the stakeholders do not define any constraints or leave it open ended at any stage of product development so you are saying that you know uh, if the stakeholder did not like leave it open ended yeah. yeah oh you know uh, i had a very interesting conversation when i was teaching at uc berkeley so people are like you know one of the student uh, say you know uh, the apple watch right it developed for everyone it is designed for everyone i said no it, it it's not designed for everyone so why because my hypothesis was it's a little complicated for my grandma like my my mom and, and sorry for for my mom she is like 70 plus now and she's not loving the iphone she is not loving the uh, you know the uh, android either but guess what the what's the device? and she only loves ipad you know why because it's a big ginormous screen she can touch any button which is actually an uh, app icon and it will launch and she can type on a big keyboard this is what she likes she don't like uh, apple watch so no device is made for everyone it's Uh, maybe maybe i would say a thermometer i don't know <laughs> uh, however you know uh, i think uh, it's it's a 
it's a uh, it's a false statement so you have to find your right and you have to fight you know it's an uphill battle as a ux designer remember this if it's new in your com uh, company and the culture is not there it's an uphill battle and you have to fight it that's all i can say life is not easy if you are a new ux designer in a big company or in a small company or in any any company <laughs> so so smile is asking what is the best way to tackle or work around red routes discovered during user story definitions when your client is stuck on a particular point but you know you know there's a better angle that you know we should be approaching so be their hero step up you know pro provide their pro give them a, an alternate solution sometime and say hey i know it's it's, it's challenging but say hey you know i'm not going to charge you if you go back and you know we help the uh, redefine the uh, definition of problem give them something give give you know give your so one of my favorite you know uh, ux person is john atoli uh, his uh, website give good ux right when you have to give good ux sometime you have to like you know uh, cut something out from your pocket but guess what it's a short term loss long term you have your client for good actually makes sense so uh, usman is i think again asking best practice for interviewing children under 15 for a children's app oh yeah yeah okay best practice so bhai the best thing is uh learn their language all right first of all because my daughter she is now 11 and my son is uh, 10 so they are talking a very different language now so i am learning that how to interact with them because uh these kiddos when we were kiddos we have a very different way of uh, like you know uh decompiling the world in front of us so first thing learn their language spend some time see their problem from their angle again uh empathize with them you know don't try to solve the problem immediately first empathize acknowledge like hey yes we see this we see that what what's your thought about it you know wh why you are thinking like that so let me tell you a very is a story of uh, like recently my my daughter she is very introvert she don't ask that many questions but i start asking her question hey what what what's your thought is you know why the things are they may gonna ask you the question like what's the purpose of life we gonna die eventually very scary right but that's not scary actually the way they compose the question and seeing the world around us and suddenly that virus you know pandemic they are, start asking very weird question we as an adult what happened with us we are thinking from our level no don't think from our level we don't think from their level. go to their level right we are here and they are here go to their level be their friend and this is how you're going to resonate with them because if you're going to start you know if you're going to talk from that angle they're not going to listen they're going to say hey, you know what this guy don't understand my feelings go to their level think from their perspective and this is what the empathy is all about that's why earlier i said if you if you just remember one thing in the whole series that's coming up and from this uh, talk empathy so nidha is asking what is your opinion on ethnographic ux research no what about it so yeah obviously that's uh, that's where you're going to learn about uh, being more empathetic okay it's one of the tool obviously is part of the you know it should it should help to unearth lots of you know hi, hi, uh, assumptions it it can it can kill your assumptions very easily which is a good thing obviously any other, any user research tool but don't rely on one right so qualitative and quantitative both things work for you the data but measure the right data don't measure the wrong data and we will talk more about it in my next series about you know how to measure the right thing yeah so uh, a very long question by ashar so ux in hardware products can be tricky in the way that different user segments can have different experiences and journeys from for the same problem right uh, do we try to incorporate all segments or lean in on the major user segments yeah you know 
so here's the thing i i had a hardware actually you know uh product i don't know if i'm i'm allowed to talk about it uh openly uh regarding you know at, at wells fargo so i will tell you the the generic uh, you know detail that i extracted from it so it was a very specific product obviously and the need was it, it when i designed that product right at wells fargo i had a very specific need and i focus on only on that context on on the scenario that if somebody at this location and they are in that problem then this hardware can solve the you know uh, in this hardware will provide the solution for them yes you have to zoom in right and when you zoom in to the specific target persona personas maybe it be it, it could be multiple personas that's it the end just focus on it what going to happen eventually you will learn that does it make does it make sense to include other personas or not right and you can talk to me later on and i will show you what i what i'm talking about you know privately so so we have our last question but on facebook i'll just narrate it to you i think there's okay. one when you're done with a ui design and a prototype in any prototyping software now how would you know that this is a good ui or a good ux how much user like how much user texting should we do it depend on the problem right first of all what you have to do define your user research criteria as well that if it falls under the definition of problem that you had you know established earlier right so if you are seeing that this type of you know a uh, product is working fine and you had a proper problem statement and then proper uh, user research questionnaire is defined around it all right don't ask the stupid questions just like uh, walmart did in their dumb survey right so don't don't rely on survey either so again measuring the right metrics can help you understand the whole idea okay so we have a bunch of new questions amara is asking talking about the uphill battle in introducing design thinking in stealth mode uh, how do you suggest one can include such practices in agile processes and sprints for product development so for example let's say you are the like you are aspiring ixd right so i will tell you how i did actually when i was working as a software developer so i told my team member you know what i can define the whole ixd and microsoft expression blend for cellulite very old technology right so what i did i took i spent extra time extra hours on it define the whole ixds and what have you define the whole flow which helped me to be very like you know uh, become it's it, it's kind of like a trojan horse technique right i included the design thinking process a tiny bit into our development you know uh, team so find those niche around your uh, around your company or around your work and tiny bit tiny bit so the best book i would say recommend right now uh, undercover ux super awesome book which will tell you and uh, answer you exactly in more detail about this question that you ask so usman is asking as a us ux designer uh, how does one tackle issues like yellow journalism clickbait Uh, as part of a product's content component oh man okay this is not just this pro you know the problem with this industry but everywhere else right so be genuine i think i remember there was a meme there's a one guy one kid was you know uh, playing the guitar and just one single cat was standing in front of him and she was listening so i think uh, the title on that image was it doesn't matter how many audience you have just keep singing your true tune right so that's it uh, be genuine yeah. and be helpful all right you know uh, apply the empathy in your in your own work with your own you know on the, on your social media and everywhere and you can like give back because there was a time uh, i was also just like you know uh, like you guys uh, some of you very beginner don't know how, where to start from and lots of help i got from the community uh, in san francisco downtown and then now i am giving back and thank you for taking out the time and giving back uh, so sir sure, man sakib is asking for helpful links and material for 
beginners like books etc what would you recommend oh sure i will i will uh, you know i will send it over the slide to uh, arzish and i will add all the books and things that i talked about now and we'll in last to everyone yeah and arzish can upload it wherever he wants to yeah we'll just send an email out to all of those who have attended uh, so usman is asking should the time to upgrade your design system be only based on business logic no actually if you want to bring the discipline in your design then what you have to do you have to bring the design system it's it's not something oh my god because my business is actually booming then i'll no bring the discipline bring the process so if you have a proper process right in your uh, in your design organization then that's where you can actually earn a uh, good street credit from your developers from other stakeholders in your company so i think we, we can take one last question and wrap up here i think slightly Perfect. more time that's, that's let's see if anyone has uh, a question let's take one more question if you can type or speak uh, and then we'll wrap up okay we got one Uh, how to map roi of a ux at the very start oh look at the problem that you're solving and ask five people if they're going to buy the service that if you if you if you're going to provide but this is a very lame actually what you have to do is like you know step back and see how many people are struggling with xyz amount is losing from that angle right so it's it's very tricky it's tricky all right you will it's it's a little bit tricky at at first but it can give you certain hints if you start tracking the data back and see where this problem is coming from i think there's one more question if you all will. right uh mike is asking how much the investment will cost if no one uses okay better oh, no i think it's not a question yeah it's not a question perfect okay yeah no he he is right actually he is right cuz the loss that you're going to incur later down the road is more expensive than investing in me uh, right now yep agree with mike perfect thank you so much for your time i guess we'll just yeah sure thing we'll we'll just wrap up here and for the audience thank you so much for sticking around you can Uh, join us for the whole series we'll send you an email with the link of the next ux events with mudassir bhai uh, but also all the other events we're doing to check out check out our facebook event or facebook page or website or something uh, thank you so much for joining us we'll just uh, close the call now thank you guys allah hafiz